Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on what's happening to rainfall in Western Australia. We've got a lot to cover off on today and a really exciting panel. So we're going to get started now. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide, please, Tani. So I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land um, of which we're all meeting today all around uh, Australia. I'm joining from Wujak Noongar Budja and I pay my respect to elders past, present and future and recognise the important role of the traditional knowledge that plays in understanding uh, our climate. So my name is Kelly Barnes. I am the Program Manager for the West Australian Climate Science Initiative in the WA Department of Water and Environmental Regulation and I'm going to be your facilitator today. So if we move on to the agenda for today, we've got three really interesting questions um, that we're going to answer today. The first one's on what do the latest global and national projections mean for West Australia's rainfall? Uh, we're also going to cover off on why is WA Southwest drying out at one of the fastest rates in the world? And have a discussion on will this trend continue? And how do we know it's been caused by greenhouse gases? Now, today's session is focused on the Southwest, uh, and that's because the Southwest is drying out at a globally significant rate. And it's also one of the few regions in the world where the bulk of these models agree that the drying trend is going to continue. So this webinar is being jointly hosted by the National Environmental Science Program and the West Australian Climate Science Initiative. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you all for joining us today. We have, I believe, around 340 people registered to attend this webinar. So we're really um, excited to have you join. And given the number of people joining us, I did just want to touch on what is, what is NESP and what is the West Australian Climate Science Initiative before we get on to our panellists. Uh, so the National Environmental Science Program funds environment and climate research currently in its second phase and there are four hubs uh, that's going to run into about 2027. 20, uh, the Climate Systems Hub, uh, for example, uh, is, is to advance the understanding of Australia's climate, it, its extremes uh, and associated drivers. And we hope to directly inform climate adaptation solutions around Australia. Some of you, uh, if you're joining from Western Australia, might know that the Resilient Landscape Hub is being hosted by the University of Western Australia, and there's also a Marine and Coastal Hub and Sustainable Communities and Waste Hub. So next, uh, the Climate Science Initiative. So as I said, I'm the program manager for this program, and what we're trying to do is better equip Western Australians with the latest climate science and knowledge to respond to our changing climate. Uh, the West Australian Government is investing $3.1 million into this program and what we're hoping to achieve is to make uh, updated high resolution climate change projections available, accessible to decision makers and the community so that we can uh, understand our climate risks and respond to the changing climate. We're hoping to engage and empower West Australians to use data in their planning and also identify and plan for future sector and regional Pacific uh, climate data and knowledge needs. Collaboration and partnerships, including with other jurisdictions and Australia's world-class research and science institutes, uh, you'll hear from CSIRO and BOM today, is going to underpin the success of the Climate Science Initiative. And today's webinar is just one example of how we are collaborating right across the country uh, to, do, to understand our climate and to adapt. A bit of housekeeping for today's session. Uh, today's session is being recorded and it will be made available on the NESP YouTube channel uh, and also shared on the NESP and Climate Science Initiative social medias. Uh, there's a question and answer session which we'll host at the end of the three presentations. Uh, you can submit a question at any time uh, and we'll come to that at the end of the presentations. So without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our panel members. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Michael Gross, who's a research scientist at CSIRO, and he's been working on regional climate change processes, attribution and projections. Uh, Michael is also a lead author on the IPCC Six Assessment Report and also uh, the Biannual Australian State of the Climate Report. So thank you, Michael, for joining us today. 
We also have Dr. Yuriki Bend Mikkel is the research scientist at the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, and she has a strong understanding, um, strong, inter strong interest in understanding and assessing the impacts of Australia's water resources, uh, both with their historical and uh, future perspectives. Uh, Yuriki's been leading BOM's National Hydrological Projections Project, which is about providing consistent information nationally on the future of the state, uh, future of the country's rainfall, soil moisture, runoff and evapotranspiration. Uh, so thank you for joining us today as well. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Pandora Hope, uh, who's also a research scientist at the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, and she's been working on attributing extreme climate events to climate change and other drivers. Uh, she was the lead author also for the Six Assessment uh, IPC Working Group One report. Uh, and Pandora also has a real strong passion for furthering our understanding of West Australia's climate. Uh, she was a researcher and co-manager of the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative from 2002 to 2012, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, and also a lead author on the climate change in Australia projections for the Southwest, uh, Western Australia and South Australia, Southern South Australia. Uh, so I'm going to pass straight on to Michael now uh, and we'll kick off this webinar with Michael. Thanks very much, Kelly. And thanks very much for everyone who's, who's come along. Um, so I'm gonna be covering a brief overview of the IPC sixth assessment report is that is now a, a big kind of piece of information and piece of uh, thing out there in the world that's an important context for what we do here in Australia. Uh, and I'm going to have some extra materials focused on the Southwest. So for those unfamiliar, IPCC stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a, it's a big effort every few years to do an assessment of the climate change uh, science, reviewing the scientific literature, um, producing uh, a big assessment, which is sort of in chapters, then a technical summary, a summary for policymakers, and ending up with some headline key messages that then get signed off on by world governments and taken to things like the COP26 process uh, about negotiating around emissions um, kind of reduction efforts. And some of those key messages are perhaps, uh, uh, you know, not news to most people here, but um, this wording has been agreed and signed off on. So some of these wording is, is very important, such as, Recent changes are widespread, rapid, intensifying, unprecedented in thousands of years. And on attribution, there's quite a strong um, kind of phrasing here, indisputable human activities are causing climate change, making extreme events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, more frequent, more severe, affecting every region on earth, and not only every region, but every uh, part of the earth system, oceans, land, atmosphere, uh, and the biosphere. There's no going back from some changes. Some are, are, are irreversible in the, in the kind of um, foreseeable future. And unless there are immediate rapid large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees of global warming since pre-industrial will be on, beyond reach. And to, to achieve that, we need strong, rapid, sustained reductions in greenhouse gases. So there's some of the headlines, but delving a little bit into the um, some of the main kind of headline Kind of figures and findings. On the next slide, this is the first figure in the summary for policymakers laying out uh, part of the heart of the issue that we're looking at, which is the recent global temperature rise has been uh, very unusual and unprecedented in more than 2000 years and much more rapid than any time in that period, uh, as kind of indicated by the panel on the left there. And it's heading into an area which is unprecedented in, um, in a much longer period the warmest multi-century period in the last 100,000 years is indicated by that bar on the left. And we're very confident that this is driven uh, by human influence by things such as this attribution style plot on the right there, showing that if you simulate the climate without uh, greenhouse gases, we would have expected very uh, little trend. And if we just simulate it with greenhouse gases and other human influences, we match that trend very closely. So this is giving us confidence that um, human influence has explained to within the error bars, all of the recent warming. That's a combination of greenhouse gases offset a little bit by aerosols and others, and then also various other minor influences. So land and ocean together warmed by about 1.1 degrees, land more than the ocean, 1.6, and the ocean about 0.9 since the late 19th century. Going to the next slide, looking into the future, 
uh, we can make projections and we have to do this by looking at different emissions scenarios, scenarios of human development and the resulting emissions and, and, and concentrations of greenhouse gases. On the left shows global average temperature under each of those different um, scenarios, uh, which are kind of called the shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs from a, an extremely high and ongoing acceleration of, um, of emissions, SSP 5, 8.5, through to one where we rapidly transition to net zero uh, and stabilize the global temperature there, SSP 1, 1.9. And below that temperature plot, you can see the spatial distribution is not even, greater over land than over ocean, highest in the Arctic, and lowest over some ocean regions, including the Southern Ocean. If we get to 1.5, 2 or 4 degrees, that pattern is very consistent, just uh, bigger. Some changes, just going back to that one just quickly, um, some changes don't stabilise this century, even if we do stabilise emissions. And this is showing global average sea level. Obviously, it's higher under high emission scenarios, low under the lower emission scenarios, but it does progress and continue after um, the end of this century uh, for hundreds to thousands of years. Next, going to the next slide. Um, there's more regional information in the IPCC assessment report than all previous um, versions. Uh, there's dedicated chapters and there's also the Atlas and there's also the interactive Atlas online tool. And here's just an example figure uh, showing warming over Australia, New Zealand, Australasia, showing that Australian warming since late 19th century is roughly in line with the global land average, something like around 1.6 degrees. Um, and Western Australia is, is similar to the national average. But there's a variation across Australia. The recent trend has been lower in the north northwest area of Australia due to increase in cloud and rainfall, kind of making a warming minimum. Uh, and then there's been slightly warming maximum in parts of inland eastern Australia. It's lower over New Zealand uh, uh, because of the moderating effects of the ocean, among other things, uh, but definitely significant warming detected in most regions. Going to the next slide. So we're here to talk about rainfall. So what does the global assessment of rainfall uh, show? Uh, global average rainfall uh, is due to, is, has been increasing. It's projected to continue increasing because there's a warmer atmosphere, can hold more moisture. The hydrological cycle means that there's a small global rainfall, but no one lives in the global average. We live where we live and it's very different regionally. So the regional pattern, the kind of typ typified pattern there is a, given by the a multi-model mean um, projection uh, if we get to two degrees of global warming relative to 1850 to 1900. And you can see areas where there's less certainty about the direction of change or the direct or the change might not be uh, very great in shaded, but some regions are very distinct and very um, strong signals, such as wetter at the poles, drier at certain areas of the mid latitudes, including the Mediterranean, parts of Southern uh, Africa and South America and Southwest Western Australia. Uh, and then also wetter in some areas of the equator. So going to the next slide, uh, the assessment also includes this kind of synthesis by, uh, what, by the reference region. So you can imagine this kind of schematic of hexagons represents all the different regions of the world. Uh, you can kind of almost see a, a world map kind of imposed on that kind of shape. And various different climate impact drivers, which are the kind of climate factors that could directly lead to impacts uh, are kind of assessed and, um, and presented as this kind of schematic. This particular one is looking at agricultural and ecological drought and it kind of summarises through these different colour codes and, and dots, um, the likely assessed direction of change, including uh, if there's a high confidence, medium or low confidence. And you can see Northern Australia, including you know, Northern Western Australia, it stands out in this uh, assessment as being uh, the only green hexagon on the, on the figure showing a decrease over recent decades in agricultural and ecological drought. But there's low confidence that this is a, a signal due to climate change and that this may continue. So the Northern Australia is, is, um, has been showing a decrease in drought, uh, agricultural and ecological drought, but it's not, not necessarily something that we expect to continue. So going to the next slide. Um, along with the um, report and the chapters and the big thick uh, 4,000 page uh, report to read through, there's also a set of other material that's going to be, that will hopefully be uh, useful, including this is an example figure from uh, the Australasia fact sheet. And this kind of summarizes the, uh, some temperature extremes 
average rainfall and, and uh, one measure of extreme rainfall, the, the maximum one day rainfall at 1.5, 2 and 4 degrees of global warming, showing that typical pattern in southwest Western Australia, uh, less certain direction of change in northern uh, Western Australia, and kind of indicating you know, in, but that uh, extreme rainfall does not necessarily follow the change in mean rainfall. We actually expect uh, an increase in hourly to daily extreme rainfalls in most places uh, uh, or virtually all places uh, at all kind of levels of future global warming. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's quite a high level of confidence in that, in that projection. So definitely check out the, the fact sheet. Also definitely have a look at the uh, IPCC interactive atlas online tool. That was the, the chapter I was involved in, the atlas and the interactive atlas tool. Um, and there's a lot of things to explore for yourself uh, in that tool. Um, there's also um, details about the projected change in Australia at different global warming levels. This is this kind of way of thinking about the future, not in terms of a time horizon or a mission scenario, but a level of global warming, however and whenever we get there, uh, on the national projections at climatechangeinaustralia.gov.au. So I hope that's given you a whirlwind kind of quick kind of preview of some of the important parts in the IPCC uh, six assessment report, working group one report. Also keep an eye out for the Working Group 2 report coming out at the end of this year, and that's on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. So going quickly to the next slide, here is some material, not from the IPCC report, but just uh, some, some from other sources, having a little look at the, the Southwest in particular. So looking back in time, we know from uh, right to 1974 at least, the declining trend in southwest Western Australia winter rainfall was detected and noted in a scientific publication. Between that time and then by 1992, um, Nichols and Lavery uh, wrote a, point, uh, a paper, that's of course Neville Nichols, who's still a big figure in, in climate research in Australia, presented a very thoughtful discussion of the possible impact of human influence on uh, southwest Western Australian rainfall. There's a little kind of couple of uh, text snippets there. The possibility that global warming from the quote unquote greenhouse effect might be uh, driving rainfall trends in Australia is, is certainly um, you know, a, a con of some concern, you know, that kind of you know, understated kind of phrase there, of, of some concern in Australia. Um, and then in the, in the discussion section there, it's tempting to attribute these careful trend, these rainfall trends to the enhanced greenhouse effect. Uh, of course, you know, typical scientists being very careful about the language, not jumping to conclusions and so on. And the paper talks about, well, what does this, what does this look like in the longer term context of the 19th century and the distant past and so on. So even by 1992, there was um, some really thoughtful discussion about um, the, the rainfall trends and what they look like and, and the, the wider context. Since 1992, there's just been growing confidence from multiple lines of evidence that this is uh, does contain a climate change signal. So an increase in the understanding of the physical processes behind the change, which is primarily a change to the weather systems that bring rainfall, but then there's also some important second order effects from things like land use change. Pandora will talk about that briefly later. There's been some formal detection and attribution studies, which is a kind of scientific method to kind of seize apart the causes and, and look at the, the trends and what's driving it. And also evidence from climate modelling with a strong climate change signal with a high model agreement over multiple model generations, all pointing the same way. So going to the next slide, uh, we see though here's just a summary multi-model mean picture similar to those previous ones from different generations of modeling from the so-called CMIP3, which was around in about 2007 or so, the CMIP5 set of models, which is kind of the, it was the current from 2013 to a, relatively recently and now CMIP6. And then also a set of regional climate modeling, the higher resolution modeling called Cordex. And all of this is kind of around two degrees of global warming. What does the signal look like? Less certain in much of Australia, but a very strong and, and um, distinct signal with high model agreement um, in Southwest Western Australia across all those generations of models with a kind of similar-ish range and magnitude across that. It's all these different lines of evidence and agreement between models, physical evidence, past trends, process understanding, et cetera, that have led the confidence uh, assessment from, to change from likely to very likely. So a lot of work, a lot of data, a lot of analysis has led to an extra word being inserted there, a reduction in, in cool season rainfall in Southwest Western Australia can now be said very likely, a little bit like uh, going from harmless to mostly harmless in the old uh, 
um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. Um, so just going to the next slide, visualizing the past trends and projections in a kind of a little animation here, um, you can see that, I'm just letting that play through, there's a range of possibilities though, that it, while the direction of change seems very confident, there's a very, uh, there's an important range of possibilities. Uh, and there's also, of, of course, ongoing high climate variability uh, along the way. There's also the part of that range of possibilities by the end of the century is due to the emissions scenario that the world follows with a smaller signal or a less reduction, a smaller reduction possible under the very lowest emission scenarios compared to the highest under the higher ones. Uh, but even for a given emission scenario, there's a range of plausible um, rainfall trends. So this raises, uh, it kind of answers perhaps a couple of questions, but it raises more questions. So like, you know, how much of further drying should we plan for? And what about changes to variability in extremes? And how do we kind of, kind of think of that um, across multiple dimensions? And tools to get at those kind of management questions um, need some extra effort and some extra work. And Ulrika is now gonna take us through uh, an exciting new a set of tools and analysis that's going to be useful in this area um, from the National Hydrological Projections. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michael. And I really enjoyed um, your view of the global world and then coming back to southwestern Australia because some of the um, questions you raised are very topical um, for water resource management, of course. So for the next 15 or 10 minutes or so, I'd really like to um, present to you um, the National Hydrological Projections for Australia, which is a new um, service from the Bureau and which we have developed in the last three years. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my um, colleagues from the Bureau and um, from CSIRO and the university, which really helped to um, develop this new data set. So when we go from global to local scales and we look into these particular um, requirements for water resource management, so we really need more data on multiple temporal and spatial timescales to be able to answer some of the critical questions for water and resource um, well, for the resource planning. So really, we want to understand how our physical systems change, particularly for southwestern Australia. What can we expect in terms of rainfall and soil moisture and runoff? Um, Michael mentioned while there is um, clear understanding that there will be a drier future, we need to know what magnitude is. So what more generally, I think when we look into water availability, we need to also look whether um, we have less and more inflows into storages. Do we have higher losses from the storages? Um, can we really secure our future water supply um, or will there be really some problems to be in the future? So, um, and with that, I think we have a range of projections data sets on our hands now coming from CMIP3, CMIP5, CMIP6, and this over evolving um, nature of the projections also questions us, um, how can we actually work with these multiple data sets? And some of the questions we really want to, un um, want to work through with partners. Um, so if we go on the next slide, um, I just want to quickly introduce you to the National Hydrological Projection data sets, um, which consists of a portal, uh, which has been released in November uh, 20 uh, or last year. You can see on the left hand side um, a screenshot of the portal as well as the, um, the URL for it. So the, the portal does not just show um, projections, but because we also want to understand how the future changes in um, respect to historical data sets, the portal also has a um, historical as well as a forecast um, um, product. So what do we actually show on the portal itself is uh, rainfall, soil moisture, evapotranspiration runoff on a daily um, scale and five for five kilometer grid cells for a period going back from 1911 out of to the century. And we show all these data sets in terms of absolute change and relative change. So for the projection, we look into change signals from four 30 year periods, um, including um, average match and as well as ensemble member spread. There's a range of reference material which you can access through and we're still working through some of them. 
But um, as a second part of the delivery, you can also work with the data itself as part of um, an application ready data sets. So all the climate inputs and outputs are available through the NCA data collection. Um, but you can also download some of the data, especially the aggregated data through the portal itself. So how did we actually were able to produce this data set? Um, so this is sort of the general um, production workflow. Um, we go from the left to the right hand side. Um, first, we had to choose a representative um, concentration pathways or the RCPs. Um, we choose to go with a medium ensemble, which um, looks into an increase of greenhouse gas emission by the middle of the century, and then a decline towards the end of the century. So the, the greenhouse gas emissions will peak at around um, 550 ppm, whereas RCP 8.5 um, peaks uh, doesn't peak, it just increases the um, greenhouse gases until the end of the century to about 950 ppm which is, I think, a quite scary thought. Um, but to be able to, to feed um, data into um, a hydrological model, which gives us these, the impact and the resulting um, variables, we had to choose um, climate um, drivers or climate data, which is wind speed, temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, which stem from the CMIP-5 um, global climate models. And we chose um, four models, which are a subset of the CCIA models that have been evaluated to be suitable for the Australian climate. Um, and these models are access one hour, which will show the medium range um, and then a good agreement across uh, many regions for Australia. Uh, CNRM as a hot and uh, wet scenario, as well as GFDL, which is hot and dry. And MIROC 5 on the other end is a cool and wet sort of GCM. Also to be able to, um, sorry, can you go back one more? <laughs> to be able to um, have some more regional scale inputs, we choose one um, RCM or region climate model, which is CCAM. And all the, these uh, models needed to be um, regraded to a five kilometer scale and also bias corrected. So to be able to feed this into the impact model. So we used um, three different methods. One is a trend preserving method, which is easy map to be. Uh, QME is a method just for extremes, and as well as MRMBC, which is a multivariate metal, uh, method that adjusts a daily, monthly, and annual time scale, and is able to replicate um, a lot of these um, dry and wet cycles. And all these, uh, so the data sets stemming from these different combinations of GCMs and bias correction methods allowed us to produce um, 16 ensemble members and each of the climate variables were then feed into the Bureau's operational um, ORL or Australian Water Resource Assessment model that operates on a five kilometer grid cells, uh, ingests all the climate variables and run through a hydrological cycle um, at the five kilometer grid cell. And then at the end, uh, and this is the last box on the left hand side, um, we post process the data to look into the hydrological change signal, including the absolute and the relative change. So this um, diagram shows you um, just quickly the all the CMIP um, 5 model that have been used for CCIA and evaluated to be suitable for um, the Australian climate. And you can see this for two time periods, 2030 on the left hand side and 2070 on the right hand side, an RCP 8.5, that we capture um, quite well the, the spread of the models. Um, and our models are uh, um, sort of shown in, in bold. So we capture mostly, um, you know, the way wet and the dry extremes, as well as sort of the medium range. Um, this diagram um, shows you um, the effect of the bias correction, which is quite important um, to be able to go from, the, from this global um, scale, which is shown for the excess S1 O model on the left hand side. Um, and then after bias correction on the right hand side, you see a lot of much more fine scale information, which is then quite important um, to be able to feed into the hydrological impact model. And at the moment, we're currently deeply evaluating um, these bias correction methods. Um, 
but we can um, see that QME works really well for extreme events. So we're really comfortable that we also capture future extreme events. And MRMBC particularly adds this value in the law frequency and variability. And we also have um, assessed that EasyMeep to be has um, preserved the raw GCM trend after bias correction method. So currently we're working um, a little bit on uh, combining different evaluation metrics to be able to see whether there are some specific hydrological evaluations um, that we need to, to go through. So what are some of the, the results showing us from the outcomes of the National Hydrological Projections? Um, so you can see here a series of slides, uh, starting from the left-hand side, um, precipitation at 2030, 2050, and 2070. And the three maps in the middle show the same times um, represented for runoff. And then on the um, right-hand side, um, it's the same um, plot for the... Um, for soil moisture, woods on soil moisture. Um, so the green um, sort of colors represent um, a weather signal and the dryer is represented in brown. And not surprisingly, um, consistent with previous finding, um, you can see that there is an increased drying towards the end of the century for all the three variables. And the runoff, and this is really important to note, it's um, a different um, scale. So um, we see a particular disproportional drying signal um, also increasing towards the end of the century. So if you go to the next slide, please, this is a breakdown for precipitation and soil moisture, again, on the same sort of temporal scales, um, just broken up into the cool season rainfall and uh, cool season and the warm season um, on the um, left hand and right hand side. And again, we can see that uh, confirming previous uh, um, studies that we see an increase, uh, decrease in um, both the precipitation and soil moisture uh, towards the end of the, the century. So um, this, these maps represent the median annual change for these 30 year time periods. Um, but we have now also the opportunity to work with the individual ensembles. And this slot here shows here, sorry, it's, it's a little bit busy, um, but this is a representation um, of the individual ensembles and how they fit actually in, uh, in whether they show drying or weather signal. So this is zero line here, which represents um, whether, or oh, it's, it's the, the change between the wet and, and, and the drier periods. And RCP 4.5 is represented by the blue bars and RCP 8.5 is represented by the, the red bars. And the bars themselves um, show the 10th and the 90th percentile. And then we have, again, our individual ensembles um, by a bi and bias correction methods plotted along these lines. So again, on the annual time uh, frame for the southern and southwestern flatlands, which encapsulated the southwestern part of WA, as well as some bits of um, South Australia. But we can see on the annual scale, which is on the left-hand side, that we have this consistency for almost all the models and all the RCPs um, going into a drier future. We can then look again on the um, right hand side, um, what it really means for the, the different seasons. And again, um, going to the season on the top, um, we can see for the, the drier part of the, the dry season, we have a more sort of mixed season, uh, a mixed signal, whereas on the bottom, you can see again, this consistency of the very drying signal. So while this doesn't probably, sound very surprising for you. We can also look into um, other regions such as the monsoon and north. Um, and here we see the same representation of our spread of the ensemble members um, for the monsoon and north on the annual time scale, as well as for the wet season on the top on the right hand side and the dryer on the top right side as well. And we can see that it's a much more a larger spread um, of the what our ensemble says, so we have both a wetter and a drier plausible future. 
and also with some of these, what is shown a very extreme sort of response. So we often asked, um, so and this is the, the next slide, please. Um, we, uh, when when the, the projections are applied, we often ask then about, yes, just don't tell us all about, about the spread and everything. Just tell us um, about which model should we be using because we can't have, we don't, we don't have the opportunity and the resources to look into all the different combinations and ensembles. So the way I look into is, is to work with storylines. And this shows you an example here. For example, how we could actually explore future water availability. So the focus is really not to 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 look into how much the models agree and then pick one of them, rather than looking to a multi, multiple ranges of plausible futures that are presented by the ensembles. So we can plot um, a combination of how do logic variable and pampers that represent key water management issues. So, for example, this is an example from the Burdekin River, uh, which is also part of this Monsoon North region. Um, we can explore whether future inflows into particular storages um, are reliable in the future. And we can do this quite easily by picking um, a variable that shows supply and, a, and picking a variable that shows the demand. So, in terms of representing the supply, we have chosen to use the wet season runoff and match that against the dry season soil moisture, which represents the demand for irrigation and crop water use. Whereas the wet season runoff um, represents the supply uh, in terms of inflows, for example, into storages. So you can plot this in terms of a scatter plot and see um, how the soil moisture plots against the, the runoff, the wet season runoff. And you can pick individual ensemble members and look into and explore this a little bit more into detail. For example, how often the runoff um, is failed and whether uh, we see a decreasing signal um, or an increasing signal for the dry soil moisture, which we present higher demand in the future. So um, this brings me to summarize how we can actually work with the National Hydrological Projections data set. Um, as part of our service, we will provide a series of eight hydrological assessments report that are also building on the knowledge um, being collated by the climate change in Australia work. Um, so it's an extension to the CCI work and their cluster report regions, but we're adding the aspect of the hydrological assessment. So we, for example, um, look into um, how much we're able to uh, simulate the region's hydroclimate and understand under, uh, and provide an understanding of the uncertainty of projections. We also show the outcomes um, of the projected futures in terms of 16 storylines and um, show some exploration of the storylines in demo case uh, in examples. We also work with the State Department, WA and Water Corporation on some really detailed demo case analysis, such as the Southwestern Myla Irrigation Precinct and the Northwest Pilbara Water Supply Scheme. And upfront is really an understanding of how much um, national hydrological projections complement the state-based projections but there's also a range of detailed questions. For example, we want to test the sensitivity of the rainfall inputs into the groundwater models and how different they are um, and, how, and how different the differences are in terms of um, the groundwater models used. We also want to work together on the guidance of choice of GCMs and bias correction methods and how they influence the results. For the Pilbara example, we also look into um, how different our runoff predictions are and what does it mean for the Harding Dam inflows and the current runoff, rainfall runoff models used. An additional uh, scope is to look into improved lake evaporation to understand future losses from dams. And again, so our third aspect is to use the user interface directly and access the data and work with the data itself. So to give you a sneak peek on to um, our comparison from the State um, Department's um, projections and our projections, and this is my final slide. Um, you can see this, um, sorry, it's again a bit busy, but we did a comparison between four regions um, at this stage, the Southwest, the Central West, and the Pilbara and the Kimberleys. 
and looking into um, the state-based projections. So as indicated by the yellow line and the hydrological projections as a blue line and the 10s and the 90s and the median um, tens and nineties percent and the median, which is shown um, by the uh, dotted and the interrupted line and the full line. And without going into details, um, this is showing the monthly precipitation. You can see by the, the lines that there is a good agreement and good alignment between the state-based projections and the national hydrological projections. And with that, I'd like to hand over to um, Pandora, who um, gives an overview and some of the drivers of these changes. Thank you, Ulrike uh, and Michael, some really interesting information. Um, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up? Yep, great. Um, so I thought I would just introduce some different data sets that we can also look at to really examine what's changing in the region. This focus will be on the southwest, but there are a lot of really interesting questions around the northwest as well. Next slide, please. So we know in the late 1960s in the southwest, there was a strong rainfall downturn, and it was really one of the first regions in the world that saw that kind of downturn. But we've seen another further downturn in the cool season rainfall since about 1997 that aligns with a lot of the changes globally. So we thought it would be really interesting to have a look at the influence from greenhouse gases, but also other forcing on what's causing that change since 1997. Next slide. So looking at the observed rainfall time series, so this is from 1900 to 2018, and we've got some averages here of uh, what the average rainfall, cool season rainfall is from 1997 to 2018. It's about 48 millimetres compared to the long-term average of 55. So you can see there really was that further downturn at that stage. The other thing you can note, as uh, Michael mentioned, Changes in the variability. We used to get really wet years earlier in the record, and we just haven't seen them in recent decades. So what's causing those changes and what's changing in our atmosphere and what other data sets, aside from the ones that Michael and Ulrike have already introduced, can we use to really explore these questions? So we're looking at the observed period. Next slide. So here we have the modelled result for the rainfall in the southwest of Australia from 1900 to 20, 2005. These are from the CMIP-5 simulations. We haven't had a chance to look at the CMIP-6 values yet, but we can see in the top panel, these are individual models with a 15 year smoother through them uh, from 13 different models uh, and showing how much rainfall change they show for the region with all forcing. So this includes forcing from greenhouse gases, aerosol changes, changes in the ozone hole and land cover change. And you can see that every single model by one is showing a decrease in that average rainfall by the end of the record. So that's a really strong signal that there's agreement across all these models that there's something driving them to this drier state. So was it something to do with the solar variability and the volcanic eruptions, the natural variability? And we look at the simulation in the middle panel there where there's just very little change over time. We just do not see that decline. And then we can look at the lower panel, which is forced only with the greenhouse gases and see it's very consistent. And by the end of the record, all of the models are in agreement. It's a really strong signal. The drying in Southwest WA is driven by increasing levels of greenhouse gases. We can also look at the patterns of the change. If we look at the next slide. Um, thanks, Tani. So on the right-hand side, we can see the average pattern of the upward motion or downward motion. So the red is downward motion. Uh, and this is just at a mid level in the atmosphere. And you can see uh, in the Indian Ocean, we have really strong descent 
at the latitudes of Southwest WA. And if you really squint, you can see that there is climatological trough of that blue wedge of upward motion just around Southwest WA. And that shows you to some extent just sort of how vulnerable the region really is to any small shifts in the circulation. So in some ways, it isn't surprising that we're already seeing changes here in response to the changing atmospheric composition. And with these different experiments, we can have a look at um, how these things have changed. So uh, on the right, we've got the two panels. The top one is what we expect in the um, in the um, uh, reanalyses. In the bottom one is how they look in the modelled version. And we were amazed to see that actually the circulation was done really well. Sometimes people talk about it not being done uh, as well by the models as things like the thermodynamic change, but these look really good. So what happens if we look at the greenhouse gas forced uh, simulations minus the natural forcing? So we don't expect to see that change in the natural forcing. And that's exactly what we see in that red colour right around the southwest WA region and to the west. We just have more descent in general than we would have had otherwise, and you just don't get as much rainfall if you've got descending air. So it's a really clear signal, and we can see what's going on there. Next slide, please. And in the interest of time, I think we might skip this next slide and move on to the next one, which is something... Um, entirely different. So I'll skip this one. Thank you. I'll go on to this one. So this is something entirely different. This is looking at temperature changes. So uh, if we go back to the, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Michael talked about temperature changes and that increase generally everywhere. But one thing we saw in um, September in 2016 was incredibly uh, extensive regions of frost, unusually uh, extensive frost in that, in that month. And uh, so what was going on? Well, one thing, it was very dry that month. Um, but also the circulation showed on the right-hand side there, which is from the uh, observation-based data sets, was that there was actually southerly flow coming up over the region, bringing advecting cool air over the region and uh, encouraging frost conditions. So Michael and I and a few other uh, colleagues wanted to have a look at various ways to explore the climate change signal in that. There's two different data sets we looked at, this weather at home and this subseasonal prediction attribution approach. And both of them indicate that that anomalous high pressure system that we see in the observations on the right, that big blob of red to the west of Southwest WA, was actually something introduced by the anthropogenic forcing in these experimental models for uh, attribution. So we're actually seeing a climate change signature in the local circulation changes. And I was just blown away by this result and I just wanted to show it today because I think there's some really interesting new things we can find and explore in all these great data sets. And I look forward to the new data sets that are going to come out of the... Um, Climate Science Initiative uh, that Kelly is running. Thank you. Thank you, Pandora, and thank you, uh, Michael and Euroka as well. Uh, I think, um, you know, I can speak from all of us that we've heard some really interesting insights, uh, not only at the, that global level from Michael, but how we've taken those global models and how we use that to understand uh, the national climate, but then the climate of uh, Western Australia. I think it's clear that we could see that uh, really strong signal in the southwest. Uh, so we have the time for a few questions now. Um, we'll try and group some of them up. But one actually was one I wanted to just quickly direct to Michael. Um, and it's just around, and this one should be, I hope, uh, why sea levels are expected to continue to rise, uh, even with human intervention and declining greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's a really important fact of climate change that the sea level does continue even after emissions stabilise. It's just because of the timescale involved in what leads to sea level rise. So 
the heat uptake by the ocean and then the ocean currents continuing to transport that heat and the ocean water expand continues uh, long after you know the, the surface uh, influences has kind of stabilized and also uh, processes to do with ice as well and, and ongoing continuing ice melt from ice sheets and glaciers uh, for a while after even if uh, emissions and temperatures stabilize so yeah it, have a look in the IPCC assessment report especially at the, the long-term futures and yeah once we at way beyond 2100 um, yeah we're in for more sea level rise and I'd, I'd like to add um, to that that I guess one way of thinking about it is we're still in a transient climate we've introduced an imbalance by introducing extra greenhouse gases and the ocean's still trying to catch up to some extent so it's still uh, warming uh, and attempting to correct that imbalance that we've introduced in the atmospheric uh, composition. Thanks, Pandora. Uh, there's another question here. Well, someone might have just answered it for me. Well, that's all right. All right, sorry about that. Um, so we've got a question here around, and this one might be for Pandora or Yurike, around how storms intensity and storm durations can be considered in climate projections or if we are focusing on the daily rainfall. I'd like to start and then I'll hand over to Yurike, if that's okay. So there has been some studies, I feel like there's two parts to this question, uh, actually maybe three. There's been some studies about the changes in the whole distribution of the rainfall. So those very intense storms uh, right through to the longer time scales. And Michael was showing that we're expecting to see an increase in the intensity of the short duration uh, rainfall, but in the observations, we haven't actually seen that yet. So there's a, a paper out there. I can point you to that, Evan, if you like. Um, the other aspect is actually the storms themselves. And we've done some great work looking at that and seeing that um, there are fewer fronts and, and lows coming through, but it's actually the amount of rainfall from them that's decreasing. But I have a suspicion that you're also interested in the intensity, duration, frequency curves, and perhaps Ulrike has something to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think uh, it, it's more from a hydrological perspective that um, I, I think that's why we enjoy so much working um, together in a team with, um, you know, climatologists is to understand what does it really mean for runoff? Um, do we actually see as a response to this um, more runoff or, or less runoff? Um, what is the infiltration into soil um, doing? Uh, so I think that's probably more the perspective what we do because, um, yeah, we, we very much um, look into the response in, in um, also in relationship to antecedents or moisture uh, condition, which then translates into particular runoff patterns. And I think um, for Southwestern WA, um, that's something which we really want to explore together in the future as well. <laughs> Uh, so there's, uh, maybe we have time for a couple more questions. Um, there's a few questions on how we can tell this story to non-scientists and how we can, um, you know, explain to people so that they can understand and make decisions around um, responses and uh, adaptation. Uh, I think uh, before I pass to the panel, I'll just make a comment that um, that's certainly something that the Climate Science Initiative is trying to work out how to communicate science from the IPCC reports from the various sources, including NESP, but also from our projections that uh, we produce. It is challenging. Um, there is certainly things we can do around some videos, uh, some uh, infographics, pamphlets, so that we can target different levels of audiences. Um, so I might just pass over to Michael Podora um, about some of your experiences in communicating this complex story. Sure, I guess there's two aspects to it. There's in, in communicating complex or, or um, you know, very lot of detail uh, that's very complicated. So yeah, keep it as simple as you can, I guess, is, is uh, without being too simple is the way to go there. But then there's also dealing with um, people's 
potentially adverse reactions to what they hear because it's it can be very um, distressing to think about the future and what you know, the risks are. And I guess the the second one is a matter of acknowledging and, and being honest about what, what what the evidence suggests, but then also mentioning and, and pivoting to the idea that we have ways in which we can move forward and we can reduce emissions, we can get onto one of these low emission scenarios, it's, it's a matter of getting on with the job. And also knowledge is kind of a, a, our best weapon in planning for adaptation and coping and becoming resilient to the climate. So I think both of those things are really important to consider whenever you're thinking and talking about climate change is it's complicated, there's a lot of acronyms, try and reduce that if you can, and then also be aware that it can be something that people kind of you know, have a, an emotional response to. Yeah, um, I think another aspect is if we have um, interactions with the people asking the questions on the ground right at the start of the conversation. Uh, I know in the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative, that was a really powerful aspect of it, that we had a lot of those decision-making groups from Department of Agriculture and other departments um, involved all the way along. And I think that's really powerful. And what we're hoping to achieve in some of these um, projects here. Thank you. Um, we're quickly running out of time, but there has been a few questions on uh, what level, if any, has um, clearing had on climate change in the Southwest? So what, what impact does clearing have? Um, Pandora, is that something that you might be able to cover off quickly? Yeah, so there's two aspects. If you have really tall trees um, across the region, you're going to interact in a different way with the atmosphere than if you have uh, very low grass lands. And if you think about that kind of roughness component, you actually um, can shift where the rain falls to some extent. There can be a small change in that. Uh, the other aspect is that there's a, a temperature difference in the forest versus a, um, a field of, of grass or wheat. And that can affect how um, sort of the thermals or the convective activity occurs. But the overriding factor really for the region is this change in the weather systems. And so if you're just not getting the same weather systems coming through, you can't extract any rain from them because they're not there. So um, it certainly is a factor, but it's not a major factor. All right. Um, we've, we've got a few questions that we won't be able to get to, but just one um, for you, Iroke, on um, when the BOM hydrological projections guidance material and reports uh, will be published. Yes, yeah, so this is an um, easy question to answer. Uh, this will be um, by the end of March. And please let me know. Um, I'm happy to send you an email uh, when this release is, is there um, so that you are aware of this. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we might have mm -hmm. to leave it at that. And I'm sorry for the people we haven't got through your questions. Uh, but I would just like to say thank you to our incredible panel today and for sharing some of your research and insights and contributions to this space. There is some upcoming events that some of you might be interested in. Uh, so there is one uh, later in February on developing a storylines approach for regional climate change information. For those of us who are in Western Australia, that is an early, um, an early start, I think at 7am. However, just to note that this webinar will be made available online and so will these upcoming events as well. So if you do miss out, uh, you can look on the uh, NEST website to re review them. There's also another uh, webinar later in February on understanding Australia's future climate, uh, the latest IPCC projections and our current understanding of climate drivers. This webinar will be based on the IPCC Working Groups 1's uh, contribution and insights. But just to keep your um, eyes out, the Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 reports, so one on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability and one on climate mitigation are being released um, very shortly, actually. And um, so that will be some uh, another piece of evidence and another bit of information for us all. So I'd like to uh, finish the webinar there. Uh, once again, thank you everyone who has taken the time to listen in and join us. Uh, and thank you for our panel and um, for sharing your insights with us.